In this and future tutorials, we'll look at network architectures that emphasize security. All these models use layers or rings of trust as their basis, as their little graphic depicts here. We start with the most basic model. Our organization does much of its work on its internal LAN. It occasionally accesses the WAN or Internet to use cloud services. Our organization does not use any services that require unsolicited traffic from the WAN to access any LAN resources. The model here has two zones of trust. The most trusted zone is always in the middle. This is the corporate LAN. Trust is always highest in this zone. The outside ring will always represent the internet, which is the least trusted zone. We only have these two zones in our simple model. We'll add zones uh, later as we cover more diverse security models. Between the zones, we need to have some uh, security device. We do not want nodes on the untrusted zone to access our trusted LAN. Here's where our boundary security appliance is placed. This tutorial discusses the philosophy and considerations of how to implement security for our organization. Examples will illustrate how to configure our OpenSense security appliance to meet these needs. This consideration is to use network address translation on our internal LAN. In the example here, our 172 network has our corporate PCs and servers. Without any translation, Frames flowing out through our band boundary rotor will have 172 addresses that can be viewed by potential hackers. It's easy to launch attacks against an organization's nodes if you know their real IP address. So NAT here provides security by translating all internal LAN addresses to a single WAN address. Here, everything coming from the LAN looks like it comes from 142 dot sixteen dot three dot one. Now internal IP addresses can't be discovered by external bodies. We make that change to our internal network. We'll configure OpenSense to use NAT for translating our LAN addresses and we'll use a DHCP service on OpenSense to provide IP addresses for our LAN PCs. In OpenSense we'll go to firewall outbound uh, we had disabled the outbound NAT. We're now going to enable that. We'll save that, make sure we apply the changes. We also need to go down here to services and look at DHCP, our server. We're going to enable that on our 10.1 interface. Now we're just going to, we have a possible range here. Uh, we have some static addresses, but we're just going to enable DHCP from dot 10 to dot 20. That should be fine for our uh, needs. We don't need to put in the DNS server or the gateway. It will know that. There are some places here where you could specify it if it was different uh, from what FreeBSD um, was using itself internally. Once we do that, we go to our um, LAN machine and we look at uh, setting that up for DHCP. So we've configured our LAN machine for DHCP. We've verified that it's getting an address and that the router and the DNS service is working properly. You can bring up a web browser. It should be able to uh, browse the internet at this point. Our organization must now decide on a security philosophy. First, we allow no unsolicited traffic from the WAN to the LAN. That's pretty easy to set up. But for traffic from the LAN to the WAN, we can use two different models. By default, we could choose to allow all traffic, or by default, we can choose to block all traffic. Let's look at these two models in more detail. The first model is called blacklisting. We allow all traffic out from the LAN, but then block traffic that doesn't need to flow. For instance, Maybe employees are accessing an FTP service and they don't need to. So you would choose to block those outgoing ports. This is generally easy to administrate and it's great for employees because they can use new internet services with no uh, impediments. Maybe they're investigating a new cloud service for backing up data. Maybe they're even attaching to social media when they shouldn't be. 
But this is uh, pretty insecure and possibly naive. As an administrator, do you really think you can identify every possible security threat that might come in on a connection to a new social media service that one of your employees has attached to? As you find issues, your blacklist will grow and grow and grow. The other model is called whitelisting. Everything's blocked by default and you allow only traffic that has been considered and approved. This protects against many more threats than blacklisting. However, employees may find it a more frustrating experience. They might need to get uh, to submit a request to an IT manager to get ports open if they wish to use a new internet service. Whitelisting can also be more difficult to troubleshoot networking apps. You may open ports to permit a service, such as a cloud backup service, only to find that some other ports must also be open and they weren't listed in the documentation. Which philosophy you use depends on uh, the employees that you have, their levels of experience, the trust that you can place in them, and the type of business you're doing. Most corporations find that whitelisting gives them a better security model. We're going to look at a model here that has an SSH service on the WAN side that we need to log into uh, from the LAN side. There's a test account here. We'll also look at how OpenSense uh, sets up the rules uh, to permit this. Let's look, first look at our firewall rules. We'll see from the WAN side that nothing is permitted. We've allowed um, web traffic into the WAN side just so we can uh, run our little browser interface, but this is typically not something you would do. You would shut off this rule so you only manage OpenSense from the LAN side. But other than that, no uh, traffic is permitted, no unsolicited traffic is permitted from the WAN uh, into the LAN side. Now by default, OpenSense had allowed all traffic, uh, so this is using a blacklisting model. Now we're going to disable these rules. And by disabling this, these rules, what we're doing is we're using a whitelisting. Nothing is allowed out of our LAN unless we want to add a rule. So we'll add a rule allowing SSH out. We're going to pass traffic from the LAN interface. The protocol for SSH is TCP. The destination port address is going to be SSH. Whoops. Wrong place. Destination port range. And our description will the allow SSH traffic and we'll save this and we apply the changes. So the source can be anything source, port, the destination bound for 22 and we're going to allow that traffic. Now we could further um, lock down this rule by saying only certain source addresses uh, can be allowed traffic as well. So you can make this as restrictive as you want. You'll notice that this rule um, is enabled. These two are disabled. And remember, these rules are done uh, from the top down. So sometimes order, especially if you're using blocking rules, the order is important. We have to go on to our WAN machine, make sure we allow this SSH uh, service uh, that we want to have here. So we click remote login. All users because I have a standard user account that I'm logging into. Uh, it'll show what address we have to use here. Uh, 0 0.73 on the WAN side. We're now on our LAN computer here, LAN PC. We want to get out through our firewall to connect to this so we would use SSH test account at and that's our address and so we're prompted for the password we 
put in the password, and then we have a connection and we have uh, access to use SSH to manage that machine. Now we'll prove that this rule uh, works. We'll first exit out here. We will turn off or disable this rule. We'll apply the changes to our firewall. We need to make sure we s shut down the session. If the session is still open, we can still get in, but we've closed the session and now we'll uh, try to connect. And you'll see that this will hang. This won't allow uh, anything to get through. So finally, as part of your, uh, your next uh, work exercise, you're going to set up a couple new services on this uh, WAN machine, remote screen sharing, and you can set that up by simply uh, coming into your WAN machine and clicking a screen sharing here for all users so you could uh, get in to that machine through screen sharing. You're also going to set up a little web server here. Now, setting up the web server is fairly easy. Uh, I leave that for some uh, research, but all you should need to do is change the name of one file that already exists inside of OS X, and you just need to start a built-in web service, and I'll leave that for you to do. Once you have that working, you can modify this web file up here to put your name in something a little more personal and you'll take some screenshots to show uh, this all works. So your exercise is to uh, activate these two services, use the whitelisting method to make sure you deny all traffic from the LAN to the WAN, and just uh, enable rules that allow SSH, remote screen sharing, web server, and then demonstrate uh, that, that those rules work.